All right, it's time for part two. In the cold vacuum of space, under the brightly shining flag, there is a ship carrying two Gundams, a bunch of veterans and a 15-year-old kid. Last time, we left off where the Mother Vanguard's crew opted for a desperate and risky plan to defeat the Jupiter Empire. With the blue planet at stake and considering the intensity of their skirmishes thus far, it is now apparent that time is of the essence. In the first part, I covered the first three chapters of Volume 1, and this one will be covering the plot from Chapter 4 all the way to Volume 5's second chapter. Suffice to say, this is going to be a long one, so without further ado, let's get to it. Admittedly, it's been a while, so let me catch you up to speed on what has happened thus far. After the events of the movie Mobile Suit Gundam F91, set in UC-0123, Seabook, Cecily and Zabine took control of the Crossbone Vanguard and became space pirates. They began attacking a faction known as Jupiter Empire, which is under the firm grasp of a dictator called Crux Dogati. An engineering student by the name of Tobia Ernax joins the pirates alongside Bernadette Briette, a little girl with blonde hair who is on the run from the Empire. Having fought the Jovian forces multiple times, Cecily, now under her Rona family birth name, chooses to carry out a pinpoint strike in order to topple the head of the Empire. In the Jupiter's orbit, one of the oxygen gathering stations picks up a distress call. Oddly enough, it's Tobia. He's being pursued by Crossbone Vanguard's mobile suits and appears to have a wounded passenger in the cockpit. Suddenly, the X-2 pulls out a large beam cannon. This is of course a part of the plan. In the meantime, the Jupiter forces begin to sortie, with a custom-colored red battalion within their ranks. Its pilot is a bearded Jovian, who commands the squad to proceed in a high mobility formation. This maneuver, by the way, has the battalions retract their legs and enter a sort of a cruising mode, trading fuel efficiency for sheer speed. Having sighted the enemy, Zabine moves on to the plan's next phase, firing upon Tobias Zondo Gay and heavily damaging it. The one-eyed soldier smirks at the results of his work, which distract him from a red mobile suit coming from the side. The large booster tank attached to the Crossbone Gundam X2 erupts into a fiery blaze. The Black Gundam emerges from the cloud of smoke, encountering the Red Batala and having to parry a swift kick from the assailant. Both mobile suits open fire, with the others not staying too far behind. An old man, sitting in the X-1's cockpit, flies in to assist Blondie, and after they interrupt Zabine's fight with the Red Batala, both agree to retreat back into the ship. The Jovian forces like the cruising speed to chase them, which the bearded Jovian acknowledges with a frustrated sigh. The only thing left from the encounter is the heavily damaged Zondo Gay, which the Jupiter's forces bring onto the ship. The nature of that mission, which Bera and Kincaid brought up earlier, is now made completely clear. Tobia and one of the space pirates are to infiltrate this facility and gather information. Kincaid is playing the part of the wounded escapee and he's doing a fairly decent job at it, since the Jovians stationed there have fallen for the cover story hook, line and sinker. While the head of the base is quite eager to know more, the bearded Jovian from earlier takes the no-nonsense approach, taking Tobia and Kincaid towards the station's hospital. He also mentions that Tobia reminds him of his son, who perished during a work accident. Upon noticing the look on the pirate kid's face, he gives Tobia a reassuring smile, introducing himself as Barnes Gurns back and escorting the duo to the elevator. As Kincaid and Tobia are continuing through the facility, Kincaid gets up from the stretcher he's been placed on, knocking out the guard. They got in. We go back a little bit, with the captain of the Mother Vanguard giving an announcement to a couple of Jovian prisoners of war. Long story short, she plans to release them. Into space, that is. Now, if you're assuming that getting stranded in space is an especially fucked up way to die, you'd be correct. I mean, if you've seen Victory Gundam, you're more than familiar with what a fate like that could do to a person's psyche. However, Fuala Griffin losing her marbles aside, Bera does order the space pirates to drop the POWs off near the usual Jupiter patrol routes. 
which is slightly less cruel, but I'll elaborate on this a little bit later. While Tobia is a little surprised about the extent to which she goes to avoid killing, he also comes up with an idea to use these drop-offs as an opportunity for infiltrating the Empire. However, given both Barra's reply and her expression while doing so, he quickly learns that such a thing was tried, and the results were not ideal to say the least. The pirate kid goes to see Kincaid, noticing that something happens to his hand. As it turns out, Kincaid has changed his own fingerprints and added an identification number onto his hand, muttering something about the Jovian security being somewhat strict. He's acting very casual, as opposed to Tobias' more concerned look, and we promptly see the reason for the latter. There's a corpse lying on the table, dressed in a standard Jupiter Empire spacesuit, and as Kincaid clarifies, the deceased pilot is the original owner of the identification number. After all, this is still a war, so the numbers of casualties will never be zero. As the two leave for their mission, the rest of the crew stops by to see them off. The image of the dead Jovian hasn't left Tobias' mind, and the pirate kid starts to think about the contradiction of his new profession. They're fighting a war, during which they have to kill at some point, yet they let their opponents live. Not to mention, regardless of how righteous their goals are, they are still pirates, and they still rob resources. Are the efforts to keep the casualties low just a shallow excuse to give them some kind of a moral high ground? Almost as if he read his fault. Sabine Sharo chimes in, saying that his suspicions are justified. As we've seen earlier, the one-eyed soldier has more straightforward views on waging a war, seeing mercy as nothing more than a hindrance, and wanting to end conflicts as fast as possible, without any remorse or hesitation. Briefly taken back by this, Tobia walks off, meeting Bernadette on the way. She is very concerned for the pirate kid knowing full well what the mission entails. Kincaid tries to reassure her that Tobia will do his best, and the elderly Zondo gay pilot that warned Tobia during the ambush attack from earlier says that the kid has the qualities of a new type. Given how shamelessly did the old man spell something that will become more important later on, I have no choice but to explain what a new type is. Don't worry, I'll be brief. Just wanted to catch up the people not playing the home game when it comes to Gundam stuff. So, a new type is a human being that has gained some sort of a sixth sense which can help them in combat, and gives them better spatial awareness on top of limited telepathic abilities. That's what a new type is, in the broadest strokes possible. Anyways, the old man also claims that he is a new type as well, boasting that he took down six MS-09 doms in a single ball, and Stobia is unsure whether he should be impressed or whether the old man is embellishing some of his claims. Nonetheless, before he interjects, the old man tries to be a little dramatic and says that one has to endure about two or three near-death experiences before awakening as a new type. Bernadette hands Toby a small trinket as a good luck charm, and the pirate kid finally gets to leave. Additionally, Zabine reassures the now disguised Kincaid about the fact that regardless of their disagreements, the blondie can at the very least be trusted with keeping the ship and the bearer safe. Going back to the two infiltrators, both change into Jovian uniforms. Continuing onward, with the now unconscious guard taking Kincaid's place on the stretcher. Continuing down the hall, Tobia is reminded of Barra's instructions for their infiltration mission. Aside from the summaries of what we already know, the pirate kid also recalls Barra saying something about how the Jupiter Empire goes out of its way to destroy any and all data, should it be at risk of falling into enemy hands, further reinforcing the notion that sneaking in and stealing the data out of Jupiter's database directly is the best course of action. As the two pirates walk through the hallway, Tobia sees a woman begging a taller Jupiter citizen for water, which momentarily distracts him. Just like the boy has heard earlier, the water is much more scarce on Jupiter, which means that most Jovians get it in smaller rations. The woman's husband is sickly and in need of some water, but the tall Jovian's hands are tied. This leads to Tobia briefly breaking character and handing one of the water containers under the stretcher to the woman's daughter which doesn't go over too well. 
To prevent the boy from unwittingly dooming them both, King Kate shuts him up with a right hook and a barrage of reprimands, which successfully distract the onlookers and lets the girl sneak off with the water ration for her father. He then apologizes for the disturbance, helping Toby up and continuing down the hallway. They suddenly encounter a short-haired man in a mask, but continue onwards, dismissing him as one of the patients. After making it to the station's residential area, they drop off the guard from earlier and make their way to... Toby falls down, sinking into the urban abyss, surrounded by hexagonal structures of the city's landscape. Well, fall would be a strong word. The gravity here is too weak for it to be called a fall. After bouncing back up, Tobias' fear turns into confusion. Unlike on Earth and its colonies, where one has a sense of up and down, the Empire's residential blocks are built to use free space with maximum efficiency. However, the two can't ponder about Jovian architecture too much, since a loud alarm noise rips through the residential blocks' ambient chatter. On top of that, there's two Jovian patrol machines, heading towards the pirate duo. They have been discovered. The scene continues in the second volume, where we get to see the shot from another angle. Kincaid barely manages to tell Tobia to flee before his yell is interrupted by gunshots as their mechanical pursuers open fire, with blatant disregard for collateral damage. The pirate kid is momentarily shocked by how indiscriminately do the Jupiter Empire's forces fire upon them, forcing Kincaid to shove him out of harm's way. Making a hasty escape, the two manage to find a crevice between the Jovian structures, fleeing from the grasp of the patrol machines. They still briefly fire a few bursts their way, which the two pirates barely dodge. Thanks to how dense the buildings in the residential block's intersection are, they should be mostly safe. For now. During the brief downtime, they blend into the crowd of civilians, who are watching an announcement on a large screen. It's about the Jovian prisoners that Vera released earlier. Suffice to say, they made it home safe, just to be publicly executed. Tobias' reaction is very appropriate to the situation. As per the Jupiter Empire's military regulations, leaving one's machine behind on the field is a punishable offense, and since Jovian top brass are absolute assholes, the officer on screen orders the execution. The onlookers are powerless to do anything but watch as the firing squad draws their weapons and takes aim. The pirate kid tries to flee from the grim image on the screen, but in his hurry he almost runs into the patrol machine that was searching for him, with Kincaid pulling him back to safety. Thankfully, the Jupiter Empire's forces haven't found the two yet, with the base's commander becoming visibly frustrated. However, he spots a familiar face walking in from the right. It's the masked patient we've seen earlier. The commander is impressed by the man's resolve to walk all the way there and even more so by the masked man's claim that he might know where the base's infiltrators are headed, with the commander offering to provide him with any additional resources he needs. The masked man declines, saying that there's no need for that and heading off. As he is leaving, he also overhears Barnes Gurns back, getting an earful from the base commander. Based on the man's hunch, the Jupiter forces get deployed into the base's residential block, continuing towards the likely location of the pirates. Speaking of the duo, in the meantime, King is working on extracting the information they came for, while Tobia is idly sulking right next to him. It appears that seeing the execution from earlier got to him, and it got to him hard. The boy once again questions the purpose of letting the prisoners of war go, if they get picked up and executed regardless. While Kincaid tries to interject that at the very least it puts the blood on the Empire's hands, Tobia isn't really buying it, asking whether Kincaid knew of the prisoners' fate beforehand. The X-1's pilot doesn't even bother to lie to him, answering that he had guessed that something of that sort would likely happen. This completely sets off Tobia who angrily questions him on why does Kincaid still spare most of his foes if they're going to die either way. Kincaid has had enough as well, jumping into a fairly revealing rant. Turns out Barry is still holding on to the hope that despite being in a war, she can avoid or at least somewhat reduce the amount of bloodshed. While Kincaid is well aware of the realities of war, hell, he even fought in one before, 
He tries his best not to tell Bera about things like the Empire's habit of executing their own people. The reason Bera defected from the original Crossbone Vanguard back when it was under the rule of the Rona family was likely due to her upbringing as one of the Frontier Force citizens and a stepdaughter of a baker. Things would have probably been a little different if she would be raised in the Rona house. As such, she's the type that mostly thinks about a small handful of people, while sometimes missing the forest for the trees. Bera had fought the Cosmo aristocracy movement, and once that conflict ended, she was truly happy. When she and Kincaid became aware of the Jupiter Empire, Bera had the option to pretend that it didn't exist. After all, it was just another distant place, and surely the two could just leave the resolution of any upcoming conflicts to the Earth Federation. In fact, she had the option to do so, with little to no repercussions at that point. However, Bera chose to assemble a fighting force to fight against Crux Dogati's forces, resurrecting the Crossbone Vanguard name. In that very moment, Kincaid has decided that no matter how selfish, sanctimonious or hypocritical his actions might be, no matter how immoral his actions may become, he will do everything in his power to protect Bera from both harm and from the war turning her into a monster. This makes Tobia go quiet and the pirate boy proceeds to get to work on the keyboard. He says that while he doesn't fully understand, in this very moment the chatter is just slowing the whole process of data theft down and with the two of them working on it, the process is completed rather swiftly. The terminal beeps once, spitting out a floppy disk. After all, this is a manga that ran from December 1994 to 1997, with the series being gradually compiled into volumes in 1995 so such additions are more than understandable. Anyways, with the floppy disk acquired, the two make a run for it. They evade the guards, navigating the corridors, and even managing to hop onto what appears to be the Jupiter base's train. Suddenly, a long steel wire goes flying towards them. They've got company. The company in question being the masked man they've seen earlier in the infirmary. With the steel wire in question, catching Tobia and pulling the pirate kid towards him. The masked man apparently happens to recognize the boy. Of course, Kincaid wastes no time and makes it clear he's having none of it, by throwing a knife he was hiding in his boot and hitting their pursuer straight between the eyes. To his surprise, the mask was thick enough to stop the knife, breaking apart shortly afterwards and revealing the identity of their enemy. It's Professor Karras. Now without the hospital gown and the mask, he taunts the two pirates and reveals that he survived his detour into space thanks to his wire-like weapon. It's a garrote wire. A simple yet effective weapon that has been used by executioners and spy alike for more than 2000 years. While obviously being slightly improved when compared to its real-world counterparts, its simple design and its brutal effectiveness has been maintained. The professor tries doing his usual intimidation spiel, but Tobia headbutts him, loosening the professor's grip and opening an opportunity for Kincaid to throw another knife. This throw, however, does get intercepted by Professor Karras, though with some quick thinking, Kincaid does manage to close the distance and tackle the professor, suffering only a shallow cut across his left cheek while doing so. While he does manage to land a fairly hefty punch, the professor isn't too shabby in the fisticuffs department either, and hits Kincaid back with a knee to the gut, subsequently placing the Gundam pilot in a stranglehold. In the meantime, Tobia manages to unwrap the wire that he was trapped in, and while his attempts to save Kincaid from the professor's grasp didn't have much success, he does manage to distract Karras using the trinket from Bernadette. The now baffled professor manages to barely notice a leaping silhouette of Kincaid. But it's too late. The Gundam pilot lands a kick, which launches Karras away, with the despicable adversary in question throwing a grenade their way as a parting present. Thanks to the rather questionable artificial gravity within the base, the pirate duo manages to bail out from the train. We also see that the Jovian professor made it out alive, and as Kincaid proceeds to tell Tobia, the guy is the Empire's special agent, making him a very tough enemy. However, what surprises Tobia is a voice coming from behind. It's the little girl they gave the water ration earlier. 
She leads them to a diner, where they meet her mother as well as the venue's owner, the two pirates, get a brief moment of respite and start talking to the three Jovians in the diner. Aside from finding out that the woman's husband is doing a little better, Kincaid and Tobia find out that the main route to the mobile suit hangar had been fortified. Luckily for them, however, their new allies have an alternate route to the hangar for them, on top of spare spacesuits. Bidding their farewell, the duo departs through the maintenance tunnel towards the hangar. Back on the Crossbone Vanguard's mothership, Vera is growing worried about Kincaid and Tobia. About seven hours had passed since she last saw either of the two. On top of that, it is quite a dangerous mission. The wait is almost unbearable. Suddenly, there's a glaring blip flashing on the screen. Apparently, there was an explosion at the Empire's base. This makes Vera spring from her seat, ordering the Zondo gay pilots and Zabine to Sori in order to retrieve the pirate kid and the pilot of the Crossbone Gundam X-1. Speaking of the two, both Tobia and Kincaid snagged themselves a Batala and beelined out of the base's hangar. However, an incoming red flash reminds them that they aren't out of the woods yet. It's Barnes Gurns back in his custom unit. The bearded lieutenant draws a beam saber and prepares for battle. The two pirates draw their beam saber as well, closing in and trying to land a hit on the red machine. Tobia is having some difficulties fighting Barnes, since the kid is up against an experienced pilot. Kincaid tries to give the pirate kid some breathing room by charging in, but since he is not familiar with the machine he is piloting, it has mixed results. Tobia tries to go for the hippie option, discarding his machine gun and flying towards Barnes, but this only infuriates the soldier. Barnes proceeds to continue attacking Tobia's Batala. The pirate kid is taken aback by this and before he manages to do anything, his machine loses an arm. During the fight, the bearded lieutenant also reveals the reason behind his indignation. In the Jupiter Sphere, a lot of vital resources are incredibly scarce, which means that for the most part, your average Jovian couldn't give less of a fuck about who's in charge as long as their oxygen and water keeps getting produced. It is these conditions that make Tobias please ring hollow to Lieutenant Gernsback. As they fight, more battalions come flying in as reinforcements, trying to surround the two escapees. Despite their best efforts, Kincaid and Tobia are outgunned, and while they do try to keep up with the Empire's forces, their machines have sustained a lot of damage over the span of the fight. The enemy's battalions close in for the final strike, but something stops them in their tracks. It's the X-2, which proceeds to impale two of the Jovian machines, make a hole in another and before the rest of the Jupiter's pursuit force reacts to what just happened, the rest of the Crossbone Vanguard's pilots arrive. An old man piloting the Crossbone Gundam X-1 hands Kincaid a beam's amber. That's the beam cutlass, in case the page didn't make it apparent. With some help from the X-1 and the Zondo Gaze, the enemy force is destroyed, and the two Crossbone Gundam pilots manage to incapacitate Barnes's Batala. The mission was a success. As the pirate kid heads back to the ship, he watches as the remnants of the Jupiter forces pull the heavily damaged Red Batala back to their base. Aboard the Mother Vanguard, Everybody is rejoicing about Kincaid and Tobia's return. The pirate kid reunites with Bernadette, and since he sees where Kincaid is headed, he suggests that they go elsewhere. During this downtime, another ship of the Crossbone Vanguard arrives. It's the Little Grey, commanded by Captain Onmo, a red-haired woman with a very happy-go-lucky attitude. The ship comes bearing much-needed supplies, on top of mail sent from Earth. Obviously, the crew is really happy about this, sprinting towards the cargo bay. Once they gather around, Barrerona also informs the crew about the outcome of Tobia and Kincaid's exploits, especially about the information on the floppy disk. The location of President Crux Dogerty has been pinpointed to the Jupiter's moon Io, likely in the proximity of a Jovian mining base. According to the data, it's the most probable location of the Empire's center of operations as well, but some of the crew members seem to be quite doubtful of such a possibility. Either way, if the Crossbone Vanguard were to strike now, it would cause some serious damage, which is a conclusion that Vera ultimately comes to as she rallies the rest of the crew. 
The excitement is palpable, as the vanguard starts preparing for a battle. As the space pirates rush to their stations, Vera sneaks off and heads for the ship's kitchen. Given that there is some downtime before the mission, she has decided to tend to one of her pastimes from her bakery days. In the meantime, Kinkade is fairly busy with preparations in the hangar. The supplies from Captain Onmo did come in handy, especially as far as ammunition is concerned. However, when Kinkade gets to the part of the list covering mobile suit replacements, he stops with a surprised look on his face. As it turns out, even spare parts for the Zondo Gaze have become much harder to get as of late, especially given that the XM-08 has been around for over a decade. Even so, the captain of the Lil Grey has been able to get a handful of them, on top of some standardized components. Although this does easily cover repairs, the Space Pirates are left with five mobile suits at most, not counting the two Gundams. As Kinkade promptly states, this is going to be troublesome. Nonetheless, they still have a few captured Jovian mobile suits that they could use, which, while not ideal, could somewhat mitigate the problem. On the other side of the ship, Toby Ernax has finally gotten some proper rest in a while, with Bernadette bringing him some tea once he got up. The two briefly chat, then the pirate kid remembers about the pendant she gave him earlier and returns it, stating that the lucky charm earned its keep and even saved his bacon at some point. She simply smiles. The small crystal pendant was a keepsake from Bernadette's mother, who used to live on Earth. She used to tell Bernadette stories about the blue planet and even now. The girl still yearns to visit the Earth and stand on its soil with her own two feet. Tobia assures her that such a dream is definitely possible, though suddenly his expression changes to one of slight concern. He briefly thinks back to his recent run-ins with Professor Karras and the Jupiter forces, but once Bernadette asks what's the matter, he quickly brushes her off. His stream of thoughts is momentarily interrupted by Kincaid, who came to check on him and to get the kid something to eat in the meantime. He tries to strike up a conversation about the supply ship outside, but the topic quickly turns to the bread lying on the tray. It's from the batch Vera made, which Kincaid casually mentions, catching Toby off guard. The pirate kid admits that he might have gotten the wrong impression of her, to which Kincaid tells him that he is being too hard on himself. After a moment, Tobia asks about whether Kincaid and Bera are lovers, which in turn briefly puts the Gundam pilot on the back foot. Back on the bridge, the captain of the Mother Vanguard insists that given the nature of the upcoming mission, Tobia and Bernadette should sit this one out, preferably on the board of the supply ship especially with that supply ship heading towards Earth. Toby objects, since he has already been involved in active combat. At the same time, this mission is going to be far more difficult than what he had faced before, which is what Barra retorts with, further adding that his parents would probably be worried. After some convincing, however, the pirate kid gets to stay. As for Bernadette, she is definitely going, and so Toby goes to see her off. Looking through a window next to the pair, one couldn't help but notice a spherical silhouette. In the distance is Eo, the moon that will soon get lit ablaze by the upcoming battle. Much further away, on board of the Little Grey, Captain Onmo goes to check on their blonde-haired guest. She is not in her room, not even under the bed. Bernadette simply can't be found anywhere, well, at least not on Onmo's ship. As the next page shows us, Old habits die hard, especially Bernadette's stowaway routine. The crew on deck is on their bell station, anticipating the skirmish, closing in on the cold dead moon that will quickly become their battlefield. Mother Vanguard folds down its mast, entering Eos atmosphere like an oversized throwing dart. The ship is quickly closing in on its target destination, the moon's surface. In the hangar, Crossbone Vanguard pilots are awaiting the touchdown, ready to sorry. Tobia is there as well, sitting inside the cockpit of one of the captured Jovian mobile suits. The kid thinks back at what Lieutenant Barnes told him, but this time the memory only strengthens his resolve to fight. Just like the Jovian soldier, Tobia had lost people who are close to him. His parents died in a colony construction related accident. However, this loss did not weigh him down. In fact, it is what ultimately drove Tobia 
to continue his parents' legacy of pioneering and hope. With the ship closing in on the enemy base, Bera orders a missile barrage. The Jupiter Empire responds in kind, with the volley's impact rocking Mother Vanguard's hull. Jovian forces seem to be in a tight formation, in a close proximity to one of Eo's many craters. The formation appears to be eight ships strong, forming a circular defensive pattern. Seemingly outgunned, the Crossbone Vanguard forces prepare the sortie. They're up against multiple Batala mobile suits, Kangrejo type mobile armors, and even the high performance EMS 07 Arabado mobile suits. The Zondo gaze of the Space Pirates launch, though the main ship appears to be going elsewhere. In the meantime, the XMO 8 formation starts to clash with the Jupiter Force, already sustaining some losses. There is a Jovian patrol in the distance, observing the scene. Suddenly, a familiar white silhouette breaks the deafening silence. It's the Crossbone X-1, which wastes no time and punches the lights out on one of the Batalas. His squadmates follow suit, using the confusion of the Jupiter forces to wipe out the rest of the patrol, with the old Zondo Gay pilot even landing a hefty punch on an enemy grunt. Continuing onward, the pilot looks up and bids his old machine farewell. The now discontinued Zondo Gay has been his friend for many past battles. From the X-1's cockpit, Kincaid decides to do a quick roll call. Zabine is right next to him, in the X-2. Old man Umon, the former Zondo gay pilot from earlier, is in one piece, and so are Yona, Haruta and Jared. In the back of the formation is a custom-colored Pez Batala, belonging to the pirate kid himself, Tobia Ernax. This operation is quite the gamble, considering enemy numbers, with Zabine estimating the odds to be 40 to 1. However, the Crossbone Vanguard's diversion via the Zondo gaze might be the winning edge for them. The stakes are high. Suddenly, a set of silhouettes appear on the edges of the Lunar Canyon. It's the Jupiter's ground combat units, the EMS-09 wagon. And here you thought you won't see the wheels on mobile suits for another 20 years. One of these mobile suits charges Kincaid's X-1, but the Gundam dispatches the enemy machine with ease, using the beam's amber. Another squad of these mobile suits does use their numbers advantage to target the other crossbone pilots. Thanks to their wheels, the wagon units close the gap with a significant speed, catching a few of the Vanguard's Batalas off guard. After all, these zooming bastards have been optimized, which, as Umon proceeds to correctly point out, might have been for the future Jovian invasion of Earth. One wagon proceeds to take out the owner's unit, but fortunately, the pilot in question manages to bail out of the cockpit just in time. Old man Umon tries to retaliate, but another attack comes his way, making his machine lose a hand. This finally sets off Tobias' fight or flight response, and the pirate kid grabs the nearest boulder and chucks it into a nearby enemy machine, destroying it at the same time. The Jovian forces try to swarm Kincaid's X-1, surrounding it with a free machine formation. The Gundam pilot, however, isn't having none of it, reaches for his beam cutlass and throws it, nailing one of them in the head, with the weapon in flight. He also launches one of the hip-mounted anchors of the X-1, attaching it to the improvised projectile. With one quick jerking motion, the blade is set into motion again, ripping the trio of attackers apart. Zabine's X-2 is being kept busy as well with the one-eyed blondie responding with a battle tactic affectionately known as Shish Kebab. With more and more enemies piling in, Kincaid opts to lead his pilots towards a cave-like formation, and seemingly this works, with their Jovian pursuers keeping up with the pace. Continuing deeper into the cave, the space pirates stumble upon a lake of lava in their way, but a large silhouette in the middle of it makes it clear that they've got bigger problems to worry about. A giant mobile armor emerges from the scorching hot pool of lava. It even has a fitting name to go with it. The EMA-04 Elefante. The wacky yet menacing machine gets ready to attack, extending a long, tentacle-shaped arm and firing a set of beam cannons. The beam shots are strong enough to make pieces of rubble and other debris fly violently from the point of impact, forcing both Tobia and Kincaid to evade. 
To add insult to injury, the beam cannons start moving. All five of these cannons fly out of the machine towards the space pirates, unleashing more shots. The Gundam pilot comes to a very quick conclusion. This one is going to be a handful. Tobia and the former Zondo gay pilots are momentarily overwhelmed by the multi-angle attacks from the mobile armor, but can still keep up, albeit barely. The same, however, cannot be said about the enemy ground force troops that have arrived in the meantime, just in time, to receive an extra large helping of the good old friendly fire. The mobile armor's pilot gets a little frustrated about fellow Jibra Empire troops getting in the way, but shrugs it off almost becoming gleeful at the occurrence. Even with superior mobility and a cloak that mitigates beam shots, the X-1 is having trouble with the flying beam cannons as well. But after regrouping with Umo, Kincaid comes up with a plan. If the main unit is distracted, it would be possible to pick off the remote-controlled beam cannons one by one. However, there is one minor problem. The sucker has an eye field, deflecting the beam shots, aimed at the main body of the mobile armor. Harita, one of the former Zondo gay pilots, tries to close in with his battal, but the giant arm of the Elefante catches his unit, slowly crushing it within a firm squeeze. Zabine tries to bail the guy out by charging the mobile armor, but the arm twists around in his direction and blows off the X2's leg. The Elefante being a handful is now a fairly gross understatement. It also finishes off the captured pilot prompting old man Umol to run in, fully intending to repay the favor. He brushes past Kincaid, who's starting to have serious problems with the beam cannons. But Tobia, who's nearby, notices something. The cannons move in a specific pattern, allowing him to capitalize on this knowledge as he shoots and damages a few of them. However, these cannons are big enough to not go down in a single shot, which prompts him to opt for an even more reckless approach. The pirate kid ditches the beam rifle and dashes towards the mobile armor. His Pez Batawa is a machine tailor-made for attacking ships, meaning that he should do just fine against the mobile armor. He dodges the first cannon module, jumps on the second one using it as a springboard and rams into the mobile armor, lighting the Pez Batawa's beam axe ablaze, the shining green blade grows deep into the mobile armor, causing heavy damage, but the tentacle arm is still moving, towards Tobias' general direction to be precise. Though this time around, Kincaid manages to leap in, severing the mechanical appendage for good. Umon, Jared and Zabine open fire at the mobile armor's lower half, taking out the majority of its propulsion systems. The Elefante comes crashing down, and suddenly Kincaid gets an idea. His X-1 steps two beam spikes into the mobile armor, allowing its pilot to drag the enemy machine. With one of the enemy ships in sight, the Gundam pilot lights up the thrusters and hurls the Elefante towards it, grabbing Tobia's machine and leaping off of the smoking piece of debris, which rapidly impacts with the ship. The enemy defensive line has been breached, and as such, the Mother Vanguard is clear to approach the base. Come to think of it, Approach is not the right word for it. Ram into the base fits much better. The captain and the crew of the Crossbone Vanguard flagship brace for impact, as their trusty space galleon reaches the wall of the base. To clear out the enemy defenses, the ship's deputy captain orders to open fire, reducing a large chunk of the surrounding area into debris. Unfortunately, some of the debris chunks do scratch up the ship's mast pretty bad. So while the breach was successful, any getaways will be hindered for the time being. The engines stop, and Barra stands up to compose herself. They are finally there. Kincaid and Tobia watch the explosion from the distance. Since their flagship has arrived, it is time for the next stage of the plan. Meanwhile on Mother Vanguard, the crew is getting ready to touch down, and in all the ruckus, they barely notice a small, blonde stowaway. Steal a moon rover. Well, they do, but not fast enough. Having reached the base as well, the Crossbone Gundam X-1 makes short work of its defensive force, taking down even the high-end Arabado units with relative ease. Zabine does so as well, albeit with much more enthusiasm. 
Not necessarily due to the fact that there's nobody to get on his case for killing, but because the possible end of the Jupiter Empire could serve as a stepping stone to his ideals of Cosmo aristocracy. Yes, yes, finally! His excitement holds to a stop, once he remembers that the pilot of the X-1 is still around. The old man Umon is there as well, and he's got a bad feeling about this mission. In the inner halls, on his throne, President Crux Togati suddenly bursts into laughter. Since this ends the volume, we are treated to a brief summary before being thrust back into the action. As the Crossbone Vanguard reached the base, there was also someone else paying a visit to Dogati's dwelling. This visitor, however, is clad in a spacesuit and holds a small crystal pendant in his right hand. The Jupiter forces gathered in the President Dogati's hall are anxiously pointing their weapons at the door. Unfortunately for them, the Crossbone Gundam X-1 just punches the wall apart, entering the room and raining chunks of it on its unlucky defenders. The Jovian force tries to recover and one of the troops aims a rocket launcher at the Gundam, but these efforts are quickly shut down by Yona and Jared, with the infantry in the room getting successfully suppressed Kincaid jumps out of the X-1, pointing a rifle at the Jupiter's despot. Dogati just sits there for a moment, completely unfazed, and then proceeds to let out a mild chuckle. Having had enough of it, the Gundam pilot proceeds to shoot his glass aquarium, breaking the glass. However, as the smoke settles and the water stops flowing out, both the Jupiter forces and the Crossbone Vanguard troops stand still in astonishment. A humanoid figure rises from the ruins, leaping towards Kincaid. It looks like Dogati, though his appearance is now more evocative of a machine than man. And whatever this abomination is, it tries to strangle Kincaid alive. Although these efforts are cut short by Zabine grabbing one of the Jovian rifles and beheading the creature with one well-aimed swing. Looking at the decapitated body of it, the space pirates quickly realize that it was a decoy. Suddenly, a voice coming from the aquarium catches their attention. It's the ruler of the Jupiter Empire himself. President Dogati explains to them that while their mission was technically successful, it turns out the guy had cloned his mind into a set of nine bio units, with their originator being currently at the helm of the main Jupiter Empire attack force. Simply put, the Jovian dictator is in another castle, and since he is an asshole, he also rigged the place to blow. In around five and a half minutes. He also doesn't care about the collateral damage. Gee, what an upstanding guy. With the Mother Vanguard being stuck in place for the time being, Kincaid goes for the most straightforward course of action, preventing the explosion in the first place. Unfortunately, the staff at the base doesn't have the code needed to defuse the charges, with the base commander uttering that the only ones who know it are either Dogati or his blood relatives. Shit. As such, the plan B becomes destroying the ignition fuse, which in this case is a set of engines. The problem is, there is only one way to get there, and it is quite narrow, though fortunately, it's still big enough for the X-1 to go through. As the tunnel curves, enemy forces start to pour in. While Kincaid does manage to rip one of them apart using the heat knife in X-1's shoe, it has become apparent that these guys are going to be a serious hindrance. The Gundam pilot tries to talk some sense into them, but going by the replies, he quickly finds out that he has to switch to the language of five fingers and metal knuckles. Since the timer on the detonation is still ticking, Kincaid is growing increasingly frustrated, which is understandable especially with a minute left on the clock. Back inside the throne room, Tobia and the Zondo gay pilots are forced to repel the Jupiter forces, which are making their way inside. 30 seconds later, only two enemy mobile suits remain in the tunnel, which Kincaid proceeds to cut down to one within five seconds. He is so close to the fuses, but at the same time, the time is running short. Not to mention the last remaining enemy proceeds to cling on to his X-1, slowing it down. At this point, the timer is showing single digits. Just a few more meters, just a few more seconds. The timer suddenly stops, just as Kincaid finally reaches the engines. The detonation has been averted, though not by him. In the throne room, 
The space pirates look towards one of the consoles, spotting a person of a short stature. Dogati's robot head lying on the floor is almost as surprised as the crossbone vanguard troops. The person in the spacesuit lets out a sigh, taking off her helmet. It's Bernadette, who wastes no time and gets on the Dullahan puppet's case. Turns out, Crux Dogati is her father, revealing that Bernadette's birth name was Tetanif Dogati. The girl also reveals that Crux is an asshole. Well, who would have thought? Meanwhile, near one of the Jubra Empire's colonies, a ship sets off for a course towards Earth. Its cargo, death. The game is on. In the aftermath of the battle on EO, the Crossbone Vanguard is repairing their flagship's mast. Tobia comments that this operation was quite costly for them. The ship's ammunition, medical supplies, not to mention spare parts on board, were all used up. Fortunately, the Jovian survivors on the moon have agreed to help with the repairs. Nonetheless, Mother Vanguard has been thoroughly beat up, and both the spirits and the energy of the crew on board is at an all-time low. Even so, after the repairs are complete, the flagship of the Space Pirates finally takes off. With the Jupiter forces heading for Earth, the Crossbone Vanguard has no choice but to chase after it. And yeah, you also get this nice page of the X1 and X2 sitting on the speeding ship. Aboard the giant transport ship of the Jupiter Empire stands a familiar face. It's Barnes Gernsback, who had been requested on board by Professor Karras, who is currently sitting in a sofa. The professor briefly inquires into the man's background, but then cuts straight to the chase. Lieutenant Barnes is to be reassigned to a special team under Karras. This is a specialized fighting force that is currently free mobile suit strong. Giri Gadayuka Aspis is the leader of the team. He's also a petty asshole, which becomes an actual plot point later on. He's definitely a special case, that's for sure. Back on the Crossbone Vanguard's flagship, Bernadette lets the rest of the crew know about her father. She argues that the reason why she stowed away wasn't any sort of an ulterior motive and that she just wanted to go to Earth. Which is why she traveled undercover as an exchange student and eventually got involved in this mess. Even after defecting to space pirates, she thought it would be prudent to keep her cover. I'd say she makes a decent case and after a brief pause, the captain seems to agree. Also, note that Tobia was nervously holding something in his left hand before the final decision was made. That will also be important later on. With Bear officially vouching for the little stowaway, Tobia lets out a sigh of relief. Some of the crew members may be a little iffy about it, but that should pass. Zabine is being his usual shady self, and we get another shower segment. Though it's a character moment first and foremost. Bera somewhat sympathizes with Bernadette's predicament, since she was in a similar predicament in the past. The little girl talks about her father and then turns the topic to Bera and Kincaid, which gets the redhead captain flustered. Bera also reassures Bernadette that she didn't do anything wrong by leaving the Jubra Empire and that she should think for herself more when it comes to what she's going to do from this point onwards. Going back to her quarters, Bernadette sits down on the bed. Suddenly, she hears a knock coming from the wall. It's Tobia. He climbed in through the air vent to check up on her. From their conversation, we find out that the stowaway girl got grounded. Ish. There's still some suspicion towards her on part of the crew, so Bera suggested she sticks around here for a while until such sentiments winds down. Tobia lets her know that he had a contingency plan just in case. And now that the situation from earlier got diffused, he now has to dismantle it. Suffice to say, he likes Bernadette a lot, even saying that if he had to, he'd fight every single person on the ship to ensure that the girl is unharmed. There's some maintenance taking place on the Mother Vanguard's exterior. As it turns out, the mast is not fully repaired, but for the time being, it should hold. Which is good news, given that the ship's sail is basically a high-performance propulsion system allowing for fast space travel at a little to no upkeep. Think of it as an earlier version of the Wings of Light from Victory Gundam, though much larger, which explains why it has been put on a massive ship like the Mother Vanguard. Tobia Ernax is helping out too. 
alongside Kincaid and a few Crossbone Vanguard members. They briefly touch on their odds against the Jupiter Empire, which are not optimistic to say the least. While Kincaid reassures the Pirate Kid that they won't opt for kamikaze as ramming maneuvers, they are still in a fairly desperate situation, especially with the supplies running short. Another big problem is how this realization will start weighing on the crew. While Yona from the former Zondo Gay team says they've got old man Umon on the lookout for Zabine, she can't help but worry a little. Back inside, Umon suddenly senses trouble, but before he gets to do anything about it, he gets intercepted and knocked out by one of Zabine's lackeys. The one-eyed soldier proceeds to barge into Bernadette's quarters, taking her hostage. Heading for the bridge, he declares mutiny as he holds the ship's captain at gunpoint. Fortunately enough, one of the remaining loyal crew members does give a heads up to Kincaid's team outside, just in time for the Gundam pilot to turn around and take care of the trio of Zabine's loyalists sent after him. After doing so, Yona, Tobia and Kincaid rush back on board. Meanwhile on the bridge, Zabine explains the motive behind his betrayal. Long story short, he never grew out of his Cosmo aristocracy face and he is about to make it everyone's problem. Not only that, but he also plans to pull a Shapiro Keats and ally himself with the Jupiter Empire, using the hostages at the Mother Vanguard as a bargaining chip. He's an asshole, and a twisted one at that, even praising the Empire's ruthless methods and saying that given Dogati's despotic rule, he'll fit right home. However, an odd silhouette approaching the ship interrupts his train of thought. It's the Jovians. To be specific, that's the Gibia class ship, a large attack craft of the Jupiter Empire, crewed by Professor Damien Karras and his forces, catching Kincaid and Toby off guard on their way to the bridge. As mentioned, Zabine intends to make a deal with the Jupiter Empire, hailing Karras over the comlink, with the two discussing the terms of the deal. Zabine wants Bera to remain unharmed likely for his political scheming, to which Karras agrees under one condition. All the Crossbone Vanguard pilots on board, aside from Zabine, are to be handed over and more than likely executed, given the Jupiter Empire's track record thus far. As expected, the Blondie is being perfectly fine with throwing the rest of the pilots under the bus as well. Barra tries to call him out on his bullshit, but Zabine is somewhat preoccupied with daydreaming about autocracy in outer space, to pay any attention to it. The man still has her, Bernadette, and some of the Zondo gay pilots at gunpoint, leading her down the corridor, towards the hangar. This process is suddenly cut short by parts of the hallway suddenly erupting into flames. It's Tobias contingency plan from earlier, with the pirate kid in question, rushing in to take Bernadette from his grasp. The one-eyed soldier is taken aback by this, but after a split second, he composes himself and fires his handgun. The shot barely misses Tobia, only grazing his cheek, but this does not stop the kid, who's having none of it at this point and straight up headbutts Zabine. Before the pilot of the X-2 manages to react, Jared, one of Old Man Umon's teammates, throws a knife into Zabine's hand, forcing him to drop the pistol. The guy cannot pull the trigger wants to disable his hand, which is a fact that Stobia not only realizes, but he also bites the guy's arm for good measure. However, Zabine has two arms and punches Stobia away, beelining it for the exit. He may be getting away empty-handed, but it's a getaway nonetheless. Having finally arrived to the bridge, Kincaid proceeds to give chase after the traitor. Back on the Jibia-class ship, Professor Karras shrugs off Zabine's failure and orders Geary to sortie. The ship is ready to attack, and Karras is more than eager to do so, closing in on Mother Vanguard as the crew on board can only helplessly watch as the Jibia approaches. It appears to be going for some sort of a ramming maneuver, forcing the deputy captain, who remained on board, to try and evade it. Unfortunately for the space pirates, the enemy vessel is purpose-built for melee combat in mind, with the Jibia-class ship tearing a hole in Mother Vanguard and causing chaos on board. Since Dogate's daughter is still inside the ship, 
Keres tells his subordinates to wait with the gas. One of the war crime related parts of their plan and launch the Death Kill squadron instead. At the moment, though, the adversary that Kincaid is preoccupied with is Zabine in his Crossbone Gundam X2. Zabine is almost elated that he finally gets to settle an old score and charges Kincaid. Though as their sabers clash, the wound on the one-eyed soldier's hand makes him falter and get pushed back. However, before Kincaid can capitalize on the opening, their battle gets interrupted by a blurry silhouette briefly separating them. Zabine makes his escape, and before Kincaid tries to catch up, a set of explosions cut off the X-1's path, which is followed by three mobile suits landing onto the Mother Vanguard. It's the Death Gale team. The menacing trio lands in a tight formation, facing Kincaid and itching to commence their attack. All three of these are custom models, each tailor-made for its pilot. The smallest machine of the formation is the insect-like Abiho, followed by the long-armed Quaverse and the bulky, dark-colored machine, appropriately named Tortuga. As their visor covers click in place, were introduced to each of the Death Gale pilots. Giri Gadayuka Aspis is the leader of the team, piloting the Quaverse, Rosemary Raspberry using the Abiho, and Barnes sitting inside the Tortuga. With a single blink of an eye, the Death Gale team launches a coordinated attack on Kincaid's machine, with the Abiho trying to flank it. The Gundam pilot does manage to react to it, but this enemy is simply too fast, hitting the X-1 with what appears to be a needle gun. Kincaid has barely any time to recollect, before having to face the Quaverse. The enemy machine uses one of the whip-like weapons mounted on its arms to lunge at Kincaid. And while the pirate does mostly evade the attack, it still cuts into the X-1's mantle. This is followed by a horizontal swipe that tears up the front of the mantle. But before a possible third attack takes place, Kincaid quickly assembles his beam rifle and fires at the machine from up close. While the enemy does manage to block it, he charges in to engage in melee. But the Quaverse pulls back. The red machine takes cover behind the Tortuga, which Kincaid tries to hit by throwing a beam saber. He doesn't miss, but the attack gets blocked by the giant beam shield on Tortuga's back. Suddenly, Kincaid comes to a startling realization. Each of the three mobile suits within the Death Gale team have been designed and made to counter the Crossbone Vanguard's tactics. Having noticed this, he yells at the approaching Batal pilots to stay back, but one of them Ronim ignores the warning and tries to charge the massive Tortuga. Jumping in, he lands a hit on the machine, but suddenly realizes one thing way too late. Upon piercing the Tortuga's outer armor, the arm of his machine got coated in a quickly hardening adhesive, trapping him and leaving him open for a strike from the Tortuga's arms. The captured Batala gets promptly shredded right in front of Kincaid. Using the element of surprise, the Quaverse attacks the Gundam pilot, and before he can react, it slices X-1's right arm, using the second whip-like weapon to take out the left hand as well. The pirate's machine may be a double amputee, but that doesn't make it any less dangerous. Kincaid readies his stance and prepares for a fight. The winds of death begin to blow. Things are looking quite bleak on the Mother Vanguard as well. The damage is heavy, the ship is surrounded, and their current fighting force is composed of a single crossbone Gundam and a few EMS-06 Batalas that have been captured from the Jupiter forces. Speaking of the X-1, the unit is still keeping up with its three adversaries, albeit barely. Rosemary begins laughing at Kincaid's defiant struggle, but still admits that the trio can't land a single hit on him. The Quaverse Ace pilot charges Kincaid, fully aware of the Gundam's hidden weaponry but the pirate uses the red machine as a springboard. Nice. Old man Umon tries to help out, but his battalion is forced back into cover by a burst of needle gunshots. Awaiting another wave of attacks, Kincaid notices another thing about his attackers. Sure, they are built to exceed the performance of the X-1, but each of them is optimized to supersede him in a single aspect. Giri in the Quaverse serves as the attacker, sporting superior melee reach 
using a pair of metal whips known as snake hands, which have circular beam blades at their tips. The large one, Tortuga, is the team's shield, and the small Abijo is there to intercept his movements. This is a formation using the strong suits of each of their respective units. As such, their patterns become quite predictable. In the distance, Zabine Sharu is observing the scene. He is tempted to join the Jovian combatants, but Professor Karras orders him to retreat into his ship. This frustrates the one-eyed soldier, but eventually he obeys the order. As he is pulling back towards the Jibia's hangar, his old grudge gets the better of him, and Zabine says something along the lines of King Kid, you better not die, not before our final showdown, before retreating into the hangar's darkness. At the same time, a familiar face enters the battlefield. It's Tobia, who managed to sortie in a past battle of all things. The boy charges at the Tortuga, but gets parried by the shield, and Kincaid has to push him away from the web attack that follows. It is quite clear that Tobia's usual Devil May Care tactics won't be of much help, so Kincaid tells Tobia to go back into the ship, but not before asking him a favor. Given that the pirate kid did manage to set improvised traps across the ship, King Kate tells him that he should try attacking the enemy ship directly. After all, the Mother Vanguard may be out of ammo, but nowhere nearly out of options. With the Death Gale team approaching the Gundam pilot again, he thinks back at the realization he had earlier. Each of the three machines are specialized for a single purpose, and given Jupiter's production capabilities, this high performance should be offset by some kind of a shortcoming. Abijo is on the front of the formation, charging at Kincaid. However, the Gundam pilot's resolve doesn't waver a single bit, quite the opposite in fact. Kincaid stays put, letting the needle shots hit his machine, sustaining only some light damage, fully capitalizing on Rosemary's surprise and continuing onward. Quaverze is the second one to attack launching both snake hands after the X-1, but Kincaid dodges the first attack, using the momentum to launch a heat knife towards the Quaverse. It barely scratches it, but the pilot of the red machine is taken aback, with Kincaid brushing past him, which leaves the Tortuga. The dark colored machine tries to parry his strike, but the Gundam pilot slips around, making good use of the Tortuga's low speed and bumps into it. The X-1's heat radiator opens, its thrusters light up at full output, and the machine actually pushes the Tortuga away. Still taken aback by it, Barnes is forced to look on as his machine is rammed into the ship. The Tortuga is launched into the ship's mast, piercing its base. With the mast partially detached already, Kincaid signals to the pirate kid, and Tobia is more than happy to oblige, and sets a few thrusters to max. The response is almost immediate, with the beam sail collapsing sideways and scaring the shit out of Geary, it brushes past him, descending upon the Jibia class, which is still holding the Mother Vanguard within its grasp. The beam flag on the top actually manages to hit the Jovian ship, with the beam burning a large hole into the Jibia class. Bera and Bernadette can actually see the full extent of the damage from the bridge, even briefly rejoicing at the fact. Regrettably, this celebration is cut short, as an unknown silhouette walks in through a corridor. It's Karis. Outside of the ship, Kincaid's machine slumps down amidst the smoke and debris. The mobile suit is now near inoperable, with both the thrusters and legs completely busted. In fact, the only thing that's holding him in place is a pair of hip-mounted anchors. The Gundam pilot almost lets out a sigh of relief but he stops upon noticing three familiar silhouettes closing in on him from above. The Death Gale team is back, this time to personally deliver their coup de grace. However, given how heavily their mothership is damaged, they have to retreat as well. This forces the trio to pull back to their ship, finally giving Kincaid some breathing room. For Tobia, however, this battle doesn't end. He heard of Bernadette's kidnapping from the bridge and as such, he boards his Pez Batala and tries to intercept Professor Karras. While the boy does manage to catch Professor Karras and Bernadette in the hand of the mobile suit, 
Karras just keeps grinning and tells Tobia that he's not strong enough to catch him, or something along those lines. The pirate kid tries to call his bluff, but the professor was being perfectly serious, easily jumping out of the mobile suit's hand and blowing it up with a single hand grenade. The reason for the former being that Karras is the master of his craft, and the latter happening to the fact that the armor of the Pez Batala is fucking flimsy, to put it lightly. He also lobs another grenade at the machine's torso, concealing Tobia in a fiery blaze. After a brief plot summary, courtesy of Volume 4, we get a better look at the grenade's impact. The explosion took out the main camera and damaged multiple internal systems, though the pilot of the Pez Batala remains relatively unscathed. Tobia tries to go after Karras, even without a functioning camera, intending to rely on his eyesight. But the professor did account for that possibility as well. He points his pistol at the kid and hits him square in the chest. As the Jibia class leaves, the life of Professor Karras can be heard in the distance. And if you are wondering whether Tobia died or not, well, the manga's being fairly blatant about the pirate kid being alive, albeit a little groggy and under the weather. Turns out he was captured by the Jibia forces, shortly after getting shot by Karras and restrained inside an unfamiliar room. However, Tobias' confusion quickly fades once the voice of Professor Karras enters the room. The boy is understandably pissed, especially after the professor taunts him about the shape Mother Vanguard and its crew are probably in. Nonetheless, he remains in the empty room, with Karras telling him that he's been sentenced to death over the speaker. Tobias tells him to fuck off but at the same time, the thought makes him grit his teeth a little. His thoughts then drift to burn dead. Speaking of Dogati's daughter, she is elsewhere on the ship, being escorted to see her father. She walks down the corridor, arriving in front of a glass tank, and facing down Crux Dogati's decrepit silhouette. Crux Dogati tries to address his daughter, but she shuts him down, knowing full well that the person in front of her is one of Dogati's clones. However, he reassures the girl that he is the real thing. Another two silhouettes of Dogatis appear in the tank, with one in the middle asking Bernadette which one is the real one. To add insult to injury, more Dogati clones show up, and one of them answers her surprise with an explanation. In this state, each of the clones is a near-perfect replica of her father, down to his personality, mannerisms and even thoughts. Seeing her terrified look, the Dogati clone asks her a single question. What does she want? Bernadette simply replies that she wants the invasion of Earth to stop, to which the Jupiter's ruler bursts into laughter, with the laugh resonating amidst his clones. The truth is, he didn't merely send his forces to Earth in order to conquer it. In fact, his plans are much, much more wretched. He could care less about military conquests, even if he took over the blue planet, it wouldn't bring him any satisfaction. He also doesn't care whether his daughter lives or dies either. The only reason he has for keeping her around is to keep up appearances. Returning back to the topic of his intentions, he states that for the purpose of his plan, the Earth isn't even necessary. Elsewhere on the ship, Zabine is getting strung up and tortured. Turns out, the main disadvantage of going full Shapiro Keats is that you are going to be beaten to a pulp, since the Jupiter Empire's forces don't trust him yet. Especially Giri, but Giri is a dick, so I suppose it serves the traitor right. Even so, the one-eyed soldier insists on his spiel, ranting about how he's on board with the Dogati regime. Devigail's commander still doesn't buy it and orders his troops to fry him some more. Observing the scene, Barnes Gernsback gets disgusted and turns to leave, it is clear that Giri is doing so mainly out of sheer spite. However, before he departs, Rosemary, who is also in the room, strikes a brief conversation with him. As it turns out, Giri is a new type, who has been given command over the team to test his aptitude, and Rosemary admits that as long as it brings in results, she doesn't really care about the means. Another part of the ship is filling with a different kind of noise. It appears to be some sort of a coliseum, and the excitement is palpable, as the Jovian guards bring in a new fighter. It's Tobia. He has been sentenced to death, but given his notoriety, 
the firing squad was replaced by an arena. Another reason why he is dragged into the Coliseum is that Professor Keras personally arranged it. As it turns out, Keras is a social Darwinist. Well, calling him one would be an understatement. The man believes the same thing as Akame Gakil's character Estef, albeit without a sizable rack to accompany the sheer madness and malice of these ideas. Long story short, he wants Tobia to fight to the death and either emerge victorious or die as a weakling. Not having much to say in response, the pirate kid shrugs and proceeds to the arena, armed with an automatic rifle. He brandishes the weapon, awaiting his opponent. His calls don't go unanswered, as a hole opens up in the arena. The crowd goes wild as the boy realizes what he's up against. The Crossbone Gundam X2. It's a Beanace machine, standing at almost 16 meters tall and catching Toby off guard. The machine takes a step towards Tobia, who is briefly frozen in disbelief. As the announcer clarifies, the boy is to fight against the pilot of the X-2, with the victor receiving an official pardon. The X-2 wastes no time and tries to flatten Tobia with its foot. However, the pirate kid dodges and returns fire with the rifle, prompting X-2 to lunge at him with the giant lance, but the sheer size and weight of the weapon makes it unwieldy for hitting such a small target, with this attack failing to hit him as well. His mechanized adversary tries to pursue him, and we quickly learn who's in the cockpit of the Crossbone Gundam X2, Rosemary Raspberry. The pilot of the X2 suddenly changes her strategy and uses the machine's right arm to grab Tobia. Seemingly, he's done for, with Rosemary pondering whether to land the killing blow immediately or whether to be slower about it. However, Tobia is a fast thinker, pointing his rifle at the gap between X2's fingers and pulling the trigger. After a brief moment, he manages to set off the mobile suit's dummy launcher, forcing it to release a large inflatable decoy balloon, freeing him from the machine's metal grasp. Using its upward momentum, the pirate kid grabs onto it in order to reach a more advantageous position. With Tobia on the Gundam's head, and with the decoy balloon right in front of him, the boy proceeds to shoot it, making the balloon pop like a piece of inflated bubblegum. The rubbery remains of the decoy land onto the Gundam, covering its face and rendering the pilot effectively blind. Rosemary tries to open the cockpit in order to locate the pirate kid, realizing way too late that she had made a fatal mistake. Tobias swings into the cockpit, kicking the woman off and stealing the captured Gundam. With a swift motion, he also rids the machine of its rubber blindfold, after which he turns his attention towards the Coliseum's balcony, approaching Bernadette and one of Dogatee's clones, the latter of which quickly retreats. The blonde girl recognizes Tobia, hopping into the x 2s cockpit as the two make their escape. The situation outside the Coliseum can be described as an utter, unadulterated chaos. The ship's command even dispatches their usual patrol machines. Yes, these. Against this. It goes without saying that Tobia punts them out of the air, with Professor Keras watching him in awe as the Gundam inches closer and closer to freedom. The command center of the ship isn't doing any better either, watching powerlessly as the machine rampages through the ship. Suddenly, the X2 pops up on one of the displays. The Gundam is outside. I'm being very particular with my words, the Gundam is outside. As expected, the Jeeper forces are more than eager to chase after it, disregarding any and all possible costs. During the preparations, one of the Jovians notices an abnormality in one of the storehouses but disregards it, having different priorities at the moment. However, it still catches the attention of Barnes Gernsback of the Death Kill team. As you might have guessed, Tobia managed to jury-rig one of the boosters on board onto the X2 score fighter, with Bernadette helping out with supplies. Suddenly, a familiar figure enters the room. It's Lieutenant Barnes. He commands the kid's masterful distraction, and despite his seemingly futile efforts to catch up with the mother vanguard, the Jovian soldier is willing to look the other way and let him flee. Under one condition, Bernadette has to stay behind. While Tobia isn't too receptive to the offer, given the condition, 
The girl reassures him that everything will be fine. She is still holding on to the hope that she can change the mind of her wicked father, with time being of the essence. She gives Tobia a smooch and sees him off. The engines on the booster light up and the core fighter starts to flee into the emptiness of space, with the Jovians on the main ship catching a brief glimpse of its silhouette. Ultimately though, the Jubra forces choose not to pursue him, given both the speed of his craft and the slim chances of it reaching its goal. Three days later though, one of Dogatri's underlings comes up with surprising news. They received a transmission from one of the Jovian reconnaissance units. Apparently, the kid's core fighter had reached its mothership. Given the unlikeliness of such a development, the Jubra's ruler lets out a playful laugh, intrigued by the occurrence. Back in the core fighter, Tobiel eyes collapsed on the seat. After three days, three tiresome days, he finally made it. Having docked in the hangar, he sees Kincaid, alongside with other Crossbone Vanguard pilots, rejoicing at his return. The crew on the bridge is happy to see him as well, with Yona and old man Umon commenting on how unlikely his return seemed from such a long distance. Though Tobia admits that he pulled it off partially by calculating the trajectory and partially by hoping that the ship would be in one piece by the time he arrived. For the pirate kid, his return to the Mother Vanguard is quite bittersweet, given that while he got to see his friends again, the boy did have to leave Bernadette behind. He makes a promise to himself that even if it's the last thing he'll do, he will save Bernadette from the Empire's grasp. Toby also tells the ship's captain about what Crux Dogatee disclosed to his daughter about his plans. There is one specific part of it that sticks out to Bera. To control humanity, Earth wouldn't be necessary. Given how disconnected Jupiter is from the Earth in many ways, such a statement means nothing but trouble, especially coming from Dogatee himself. At this point it's safe to assume that, to quote the ship's captain, the man is a genuine danger to humanity. However, despite the fact that Mother Vanguard is chasing after the Jubra's fleet, the nature of traveling between the planets has assured that the two factions are currently in an enforced stalemate for the time being, especially considering that any combat that would take place would be a heavy drain on fuel and resources. The mothership of the Crossbone Vanguard also hasn't fully recovered from its most recent battle, which in turn shattered any hopes of outpacing the Jovians on their race towards Earth. It's still a long way to go, about two and a half months before the Jupiter fleet reaches the Earth. As such, the crew of Mother Vanguard chooses to make the best of the downtime they have been given. Kincaid, Tobia, the ship's mechanic and a few others are going over what machines they may be up against, specifically the Death Kill team. The Team Squaverse unit is what piques the old mechanic's interest in particular, seeing how well equipped it is for fighting against the usual melee focused tactics of the Crossbone Vanguard. The machine's snake hand weapons will definitely be bothersome to deal with. Fortunately, the mechanic has devised a counter against it, using the materials currently on the ship. It's an improvised solution, but a working one nonetheless. By the time the mothership of Crossbone Vanguard had reached Earth Sphere, the ruler of Jupiter has ingratiated himself with the Earth Federation, presenting the olive branch in one hand and concealing the proverbial dagger in the other, with Fedis being none the wiser. Back on the mothership of the space pirates, Barra's musing over Dogati's plans suddenly gets interrupted by the comms officer. They've got company, though this time it's not necessarily bad news. A ship by the name of Eos Nix is heading their way, carrying a messenger with Sinri affiliations. It's Sheridan Rona, Barra's cousin, whose relatives still cling onto their space aristocracy ideals and as such have a lot of sway with certain factions. Tovia is understandably baffled by this, since he sees the way high status is earned in such a system as quite arbitrary. At the same time, old man Umon does tell him that regardless of his thoughts on the matter, some people do find the prospects of being ruled by people of higher status appealing, with Barra scolding the pirate kid for saying something like that, on a ship filled with people 
who were originally on board with their own factions movements for Space Monarchy. Anyways, EOS Nix has arrived, with Sheridan and supplies on board as well. As the ship docks, Bera goes to meet Sheridan Rona herself, accompanied by Tobia. Upon seeing the boy, Bera's cousin gives him a warm yet eerie smile. Unsolicited tangents on Sheridan's part notwithstanding, there is a new mobile suit on board, the Crossbone Gundam Unit 3. Tobia is excited about the news, eyeing out the new model and even trying to guess what equipment does the machine come with. On the other side of the ship, Sheridan and Bera proceed to strike up a conversation, and we quickly find out that Sheridan is quite the oddball. First she says that Tobia could become a powerful new type fully intending on keeping him as her protege slash property, but Bera shuts her down. After which, Sheridan drops a bombshell. She isn't handing over the supplies. As it turns out, she merely used the supplies from Sinri as a pretense to meet with Bera and convince her to stop fighting. Bera tries to reason with her, bringing up the factual reality that Dogati is fully intending to do god knows what to the Earth with diplomacy being the last thing that would even hinder him. They're a hostile force, with access to poison gas and even actual nukes, among other things. However, Sheridan remains insistent on her space hippie spiel. To her, the fact that there will always be factions like Jupiter Empire renders fighting meaningless. She is perfectly okay with giving them a free reign over the blue planet, as long as further battles are prevented. Of course, Bera calls her on her bullshit, but she notices something out of the ship's window. The Federation forces have arrived, mainly composed of the Shars Rebellion era cruisers and battleships, with the only new addition to the fleet being a set of reinforced class light cruisers. As it turns out, Sheridan double-crossed them. She contacted the Air Federation forces in order to strong-arm the Crossbone Vanguard into laying down their arms. As Federation mobile suits start to gather around Mother Vanguard, Old Man Umon perfectly describes their predicament. They're up against the forces of EFF, while at the same time if they were to fight, they'd have to do so with one of their arms behind their back. One of the Federation ships sends out the message which is loud and clear. The space pirates are to lay down their arms and let themselves get detained. Understandably, panic erupts at the bridge of Mother Vanguard. The space pirates are in a situation where they can't afford a fight with the Federation. They're more or less forced into turning themselves in and attending a trial during which they may possibly be able to make the Jupiter Empire's schemes public. Now, given Federation's track record when it comes to their treatment of prisoners, <coughs> head away, the crew is very much against the prospect. Dara also tells her men that she will take the brunt of the blame urging the crew to abandon ship if the opportunity presents itself. After this, she walks out of the room, with her usual composed self in tatters. Fortunately for her, she runs into Kincaid, who assures Bera that he'll be there for her no matter what. He might not be able to do much about their predicament, but he'll be there. An Earth Federation officer thanks Sheridan for her efforts. Meanwhile, elsewhere on the ship, Tobia is losing his shit. Sheridan had confined him into a small room while spouting her usual talking points. At roughly the same time, Mother Vanguard's crew is awaiting the Federation forces to arrive on board, with Kincaid being unable to shed a slight feeling of nostalgia upon sighting multiple Gundam F-91s closing in. He concludes that the main reason why any possible resistance on the Crossbone Vanguard's part would likely be cut short is that most of their mobile suits are built for fighting at close to mid-range, which obviously becomes a problem when up against the Federation's numerical and range advantage. Suddenly a speeding silhouette emerges from the darkness of space. It's the X-2, well, X-2 Kai to be specific, and it wastes no time opening fire upon an Earth Federation ship and even destroying it using its beam launcher. The Federation officer from earlier takes it as a pirate attack, with the culprit in question taunting the battleship's crew by flying past their bridge. It's Sabine, fully intent on wreaking havoc and forcing the Federation's hand. His plan is quite effective, with the Fedi officer ordering all ships to open fire upon Mother Vanguard. The shots rock the hull, prompting Kincaid to sorry. 
it is once again time for him to fight. Even with the odds being egregiously lopsided against him, a few Batala pilots also follow suit, approaching one of the Federation's F-91s. He draws a beam saber and starts closing the distance. He also advises his squad mates against using beam shields, given that they won't stop the VSBR rifles of the F-91 Gundams anyway. Observing the scene, Sheridan lets out a frustrated sigh. Having reached the first F-91, Kincaid takes it by surprise. With a quick cut, he proceeds to dispatch the first one, slicing its arm and beam rifle apart. The Federation pilots try to stop him, but Kincaid's machine dodges and weaves around their VSBR shots, hitting some of the F-91s along the way. Briefly remarking on enemy's lackluster performance, the Crossbone Gundam pilot approaches a Federation ship and prepares to swing at its cannons. Suddenly, a strong blast brings a stop to his rampage, with the Gundam's anti-beam mantle getting vaporized on hit. Kincaid spots the source of the attack. It's a blue Gundam F-91, piloted by Harrison Madden of the Earth Federation forces. The pilot orders his men to stay back, preparing for a fight. The faceplates of both machines open up as the skirmish commences. At roughly the same time, the mothership of Crossbone Vanguard is facing quite the predicament. The ship has been under fire from Federation forces, sustaining heavy damage and likely won't last much longer if this keeps up. However, this isn't all as far as bad news are concerned. The Jupiter forces are approaching. As stated by the Empire's ruler, it's all going according to their plan. Still fighting the blue F-91, Kincaid catches a glimpse of the Mother Vanguard which is currently in a rough state. In the distance, he can also see the silhouettes of the approaching Jupiter forces. The sheer speed of both F-91 and Kincaid's machines keep the two somewhat evenly matched. With the only good hit the space pirate gets in, only tearing off one of F-91's cooling fins. Harrison's unit responds with a point-blank machine cannon and Vulcan's barrage, forcing Kincaid to deploy his beam shield. This is the first time anyone forced him to do so. It still won't do much against the VSBR rifles that the blue F-91 quickly switched to. Kincaid tries to dodge the VSBR shots while gradually closing the distance, until suddenly the F-91 gets a lock on his machine. With some quick thinking, Kincaid quickly detaches both beam shields and throws them forward. Shortly before Harrison's VSBR fires, the shot pierces both shields, decreasing in power as it passes through each of them with a much thinner beam of light flying at Kincaid, who readies his beam saber almost as if he's intending to block it. In an unexpected turn of events, his machine does manage to pull it off, though some of the particles from the VSBR shot still scratch up his cameras and sensors. With Kincaid's Gundam reaching melee range, its pilot proceeds to completely disarm the F-91 with a single hit, heavily damaging Harrison's machine. The Federation pilot starts thinking he's done for, even awaiting the final strike. But Kincaid holsters the beam saber and rushes back to his ship. On the Mother Vanguard, the Batala pilots are having quite a hard time with Death Gale Team Squaverse. However, the red machine suddenly stops in place. Kincaid now has returned. This time around, his X-1 has had a few upgrades, so despite damaged sensors, he should be more than well equipped for the upcoming fight. He charges in with the rest of the Jovian trio arriving onto the scene as well. Meanwhile, still trapped on Sheridan's ship, Tobia overhears something interesting from a Federation broadcast. Apparently, Bernadette will be joining the fight as well. The girl is awoken from her rest, given a change of clothes and escorted to Dogati's fish tank. Her father tells her the story in a mobile armor. The machine in question is automated and should she perish, it will only serve to motivate his forces. Simply put, Crux Dogati intends on using his own daughter as an expendable pawn. He even starts boasting about how his clone form has rid him of certain hindrances. In fact, he sees Bernadette as yet another hindrance, something to get rid of. Sitting in the cockpit of EMA-06 Elego Rella, Bernadette's thoughts proceed to focus on Tobia, as some sort of a call for help. The pirate kid in question is still on Eos Nix, though no longer locked in the room. Tobias' resourcefulness allowed him to make a break for it, flee the room and even start making his way towards the hangar. But suddenly, 
the boy stops, noticing a familiar silhouette. It's Sheridan, standing in his way, and being seemingly apathetic to her cousin's current predicament. She even tries to convince Tobia, who, as she asserts, is also a new type of her standpoint. Sheridan also attempts to appeal to Manutap potential, insisting that if he leaves, his soul will only be dragged down. Her spiel continues, but Tobia's confused expression gradually transforms into a smirk. At first he thought that Bera releasing POWs into outer space was naive, but this… this is beyond delusional. Even with the guards barging in, the boy steps forward, telling Sheridan to get out of his way. He could care less about any sort of new type gobbledygook. All he knows is that he is human, and being human is enough. Toby also emphasizes his point by landing a pretty solid left hook on her and starting to walk away. He charges the guard standing in his way, stealing his knife and returning to Sheridan. Showing her his arm, he drags the blade across the back of his arm, creating a shallow yet quite visible wound, almost as a display of his resolve. Some of the guards try to pursue him, but the now heavily whimpering Sheridan holds them off. Having hopped into the new model, Crossbone Gundam X3, Tobia sheds the large cloth covering the machine. The eyes light up, as the X3 stands up. The boy had made a promise, and he will keep it, leaving Eos Nix through a hole he made in its hull. He sets the machine's thrusters to max, and starts heading towards Mother Vanguard. As Tobia finally sorties, a specialized Jupiter formation exits the main Jovian battleship. It's composed of a single EMA-06 mobile armor, escorted by a squad of EMS-08 Dionas. Seeing the current state of Mother Vanguard, one of the Diona pilots remarks that at this rate, the ship will be in pieces by the time their formation reaches it. After all, their machines are there for demonstration purposes so such a scenario would be for the better. The chatter among Jupiter's forces is suddenly cut short by a thundering roar, almost freezing them in place. The originator of the sound is the distant silhouette, speeding towards them is the X-3, piloted by Tobia, who's dead set on being the man of his word. This is also where we get a nice page spread featuring the Crossbone Gundam X-3 in its entirety. Upon sighting the boy's machine, the Diona pilots open fire at the approaching Gundam. Tobia tries to turn on a beam shield to block them, but he quickly learns that the X-3 has none. Instead, the button activates the machine's eye field, deflecting the incoming beam shots. The pirate kid also notices that there is a time limit to the arm-mounted beam deflection barriers, limiting their use to 105 seconds per each arm, with a 2-minute recharge time after the time is up. Unimpeded by the beam shots, the pirate kid proceeds to grab one of the Dionas and shoves them over. Back at the Mother Vanguard, Kincaid is fighting the Death Gale team. Suddenly, he hears a familiar voice over the comms. It's Tobia, who tells him to try and hold out a little more, with the boy planning to come to his aid. Kincaid finally unveils the weapon that the ship's mechanic was working on earlier. It is a long whip, featuring a metal drill bit on its tip. The space pirate swings it catching the snake hand of Giri's machine. He also informs Tobia that their mothership likely won't last any longer. Bera has already set off the self-destruct sequence for it a while ago, with the crew heading off to escape pods. In five minutes the ship is set to explode, and around that time the space pirates will try and make a run for it. If Tobia can escape as well, Kincaid asks him to take care of Bernadette and Bera, before turning his focus back on fighting the Red Jovian machine. Suddenly the Quoverse disappears out of his sight. He is surrounded by smoke coming from the ship, with the Jupiter's mobile suits nowhere to be seen. However, a black silhouette emerges from the smoke. It's Zabine, and he's here to settle an old score. Meanwhile, Tobia finally draws his machine's weapon, even landing a strike on one of the Dionas. Mind you, this is supposed to be a beam weapon and he doesn't even bother turning it on, being perfectly content with tearing his foes apart with sheer blunt force. What remains of the formation is left stunned at the boy's fighting style, though Tobia sees it somewhat differently. Admittedly, he grabbed whatever weapon was on board, and as such he doesn't have the slightest clue how to operate the damn thing. Suddenly, the mobile armor springs into action, ordering the rest of the team to fall back. 
It's the Elego Rally unit, with Bernadette strapped on board as a hostage. Using the last few seconds of the operation time for X3's left arm field, Tobia parries the strike. He tries to break Bernadette out, but the only result of his efforts is a loud, cackling voice coming from the mobile armor. One of Dogadi's clones is piloting the machine, with the Elego Rella tail making a swipe at the X3. To further taunt the boy, he also uncovers its cockpit, displaying Bernadette sitting on board as a hostage. Tobia rightfully calls Dogadi out for this, but to the Jovian despot, there isn't such a thing as a dirty tactic. Dogati even states that such is the nature of war, and by the extent the nature of humanity. The pirate boy tries to get a hit in, but has to hold back as to not hit Bernadette as well. On top of that, the right arm's eye field has reached its limit, going on cooldown. The mobile armor spots an opening, and lands a nasty hit on the X3. Its sword-like weapon falls out of X3's hand, with 13 seconds worth of recharge remaining, for the left arm's eye field. The Elego Rella grabs the weapon, releasing the safety and turning on its thief like beam blades. 8 seconds remain. Dogati's clone starts to approach Tobia's machine. 6, 5, 3, 2. The mobile armor swings the blade. Noticing the attack, the boy extends the X3's arm. The blade briefly turns into a blur and stops. Tobia caught the attack. This intrigues Dogati. The boy caught it using his machine's left arm, turning on its eye field the moment it became available. However, Tobia isn't satisfied with merely stopping the attack, pressing the weapon in his grasp into the mobile armor's thick shell. The blade deals heavy damage to the mobile armor, with the Elego Rella's performance falling drastically. Tobia also rips out the cockpit holding Bernadette. After all, he is a pirate, and as such, he will plunder. Dodging the mobile armor's attacks. Tobia thrusts the giant sword into the mobile armor's cannon array, turning the beam blades on again. The response is immediate, with the mobile armor almost instantly erupting from inside. Having destroyed it, the pirate kid breaks Bernadette out of the cockpit. She is finally reunited with Tobia. Near Crossbone Vanguard's mothership, or at least what currently remains of it, a battle still rages on. Kincaid is down to a pair of beam sabers with the camera sensors not being in too good of a shape either. To avoid having to fight effectively blind, he tears off a part of the X1 Kai's chest armor, opting to use his own eyes to see instead. With two minutes on the self-destruction timer, Barry decides to go out in a core fighter, against the wishes of her crew. King Kid was there for her when she needed him, so Barra chooses to repay the favor. She's carrying a pair of spare beam shields alongside two beam sabers and heading towards the front of the ship where Kincaid and Zabine are fighting. As the beam sabers of the two clash, Zabine laments that if it weren't for Kincaid, Vera would have remained with the Ronas, and nothing would have stopped Blondie's dreams of space aristocracy. With a single move, the one-eyed soldier disarms Kincaid's machine, though before he can follow up on it, Vera flies in with the core fighter, firing its beam guns and forcing Zabine's machine back. However, it's still just a core fighter, with the X2 Kai hitting one of its thrusters by tossing a beam saber at it. Barra still manages to drop off the spare weapons and beam shields before having to retreat. Kincaid reaches for the beam shield, but suddenly he notices Zabine approaching him with a beam saber. The one-eyed soldier lunges towards X1 Kai's torso, and the hit connects. Blondie lets out a triumphant laugh, having seemingly killed his opponent and decapitating his machine. For good measure, he also kicks it away. At this point, Tobia finally arrives, diving past Zabine's X2 Kai and heading for Mother Vanguard. There's less than 30 seconds on the countdown, with Barra watching on helplessly as Kincaid's X1 Kai drifts towards the orbit. 20 seconds. Tobia retrieves the core fighter. With 15 seconds remaining, Zabine retreats, knowing full well that the ship is about to detonate. After a brief moment, Mother Vanguard explodes in a fiery blaze with its debris flying everywhere. Crux Dogati watches the destruction from his ship with a Nerf Federation officer, thanking him for cooperation. However, among the many pieces of the spaceship falling onto the Earth, he spots a small metal container entering the atmosphere. It's an escape pod. By the time Tobia touches down on the blue planet, he's panting with exhaustion, with Bernadette being just as tired as he is. Nonetheless, the boy climbs out, 
seeing the planet's blue sky and feeling grass under his feet for the first time. Walking through the wilderness, even for a brief while, feels oddly serene. Suddenly he panics, spotting a deer. This ends the sizable midsection of Crossbone's 1990s run, going from Volume 1 Chapter 4 all the way to Volume 5's second chapter. Suffice to say, this part is much longer, especially when compared to the previous one. We started on a fairly straightforward infiltration mission and the Crossbone Vanguard's uphill battle, which ended up with their mothership and their hopes of taking on the Jupiter Empire, both reduced to ashes. The ship is gone, its crew scattered, Seabook Arno presumed dead, and Tobia left stranded on Earth alongside Bernadette and Cecily Fairchild. During both the battles and the brief character moments, we learned that things like Kincaid's now policy of trying to reduce casualties had a much more heartfelt and personal reason behind them. Not to mention how a seemingly straightforward plan to uproot the Jovian faction quickly turned into a desperate struggle for survival. As is the tradition with most UC stories, the tonal shift had arrived, and it has hit hard. However, at the same time, where are survivors? There is also hope. But that would have to wait for the third part, which will conclude the story of the 90s manga. Honestly, I do not have the faintest clue when that one comes out. All that I'm certain of is that I need a breather, to say the least. If you've enjoyed this saga thus far, feel free to like, comment and subscribe. This is Shirtlade, signing out.